two writers, one just starting out, the other a bestseller. Join James Blatch and Mark Dawson and their amazing guests as they discuss how you can make a living telling stories. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Hello and welcome to the Self-Publishing Formula podcast with Mark and James. Uh, we're back, looking remarkably similar to last time. If you're watching on YouTube, but most people, of course, aren't watching on YouTube, so I shall stop referencing what yep. the place looks like. Stop talking about visuals. It's all in the audio. It's all in the... Yeah, so Theatre of the Mind <laughs> podcast. Um, we, uh, we're talking comic books this week, which is a bit of a departure for us, Mark, isn't it? And uh, I think, I suspect you are a little bit of a comic book guy. I am, yeah. This is um, this is a really cool interview. So uh, the background is um, we obviously have lots of students in our in our various courses, and um, one student in particular contacted me um, uh, three or four months ago. I was, took up the one hundred and one course um, and said that she was learning loads and had a few questions for me. So I was happy to answer. And then, as kind of a addendum, she said, "Oh, by the way, um, I'm the the partner of, or the wife, I think, of Pat Mills, who is the creator of 2000 AD." So, for those, it's probably more of a British thing than a, than a worldwide thing. But it was a really big. It still is a really big um, comic. I'm famous mostly for characters like Judge Dredd. Um, I am the law. That's very good, James, um, and not remotely scary. Um, <laughs> you're more of the Sylvester Stallone version than the yeah. uh, the Carl Urban version. Um, so yeah, a couple of movies have, have been spun out of that. Loads and loads of other really great and influential comic strips have been in 2000 AD. It's also published work by people like Alan Moore, who did Watchmen and, and League of Extraordinary Gentlemen and all that kind of stuff. So I, my brother was a massive 2000 AD fan, and he's actually got every single one of. It's been published for 40 years, basically. It's been going for. He's got every single episode all the way back to the first one. Jonathan Ross is a very big fan. Um, and um, I was into a, there's a, a, a comic called Crisis that he did about 20 years ago that was really political, very um, pushed lots of boundaries, really interesting um, uh, piece of work. Anyway, Pat has moved into, he still does comics, but he's moved also into novels and he's uh, got a novel that he um, he put together and it's, it's released. Um, and... Lisa, I think, from what I can gather, is handling the kind of the marketing and the production side of things for Pat, whilst he actually does the the creation. So that was to know that he was, or she was involved, and obviously he was involved in in the course was an opportunity that I felt was too good to miss. And we don't hear, um, we don't go beyond books too often, but this is a really good chance to talk about creativity and um, storytelling and and all of those kinds of things and how things have changed o- over time. So. Um, I thought it was it was a great chance to get Pat on the podcast, and um, and I haven't actually heard the interview yet, so I'm looking forward to listening to it, and um, and then we can have a chat afterwards. Yeah, definitely. And I'm just going to mention before we get into the um, the podcast that uh, Lisa contacted us afterwards and said that Pat would be delighted to give three signed copies of his new book, Serial Killer, uh, as a prize for us. So uh, stay tuned. Uh, after the interview, we'll give away uh, the URL to enter that contest to win potentially. A Pat Mills signed a novel. Let's hear from Pat. Pat, thank you so much indeed for joining us on the Self Publishing Formula podcast. We're really delighted to have you here, especially as we are all schoolboys at heart. And I should say schoolboys, that's a terrible cliche about comic reading, isn't it? Because I think the average age of the comic reader is pretty, uh, is older than that now. But anyway, let's, let's. A lot yeah. older, yeah. So let's let's start at the beginning. We're going to talk about where you are now. We're going to talk about the industry. Um, and I know it's not all a happy, glowing picture. Um, and you've made some decisions recently. But what I'd like to do, if you don't mind, is just start a little bit with the Pat Mills story and go back to, I'm guessing, the 1970s with AD 2000. How did you get started? How did this career that you have become quite famous in, how did it all begin? Um, well, uh, British comics uh, sold in huge quantities. Uh, this was back in the 1970s with sales figures that would make, uh, make us all uh, absolutely salivate today. You're talking about, for example, uh, a girl's comic like Tammy uh, could sell maybe 220,000 copies a week. Um, and there's a paradox here because whilst these comics sold in huge numbers, uh, the people who work for them often 
uh, didn't actually like them very much. Uh, now, there are complex reasons for that, but basically because uh, they, they weren't creator-owned. So the emphasis became on speed. In other words, knock this stuff out. And I came along into this industry, and I actually liked uh, the industry, if you like, as such. And so it was possible uh, to rise to the top of the heap um, uh, quite quickly, um, as long as you have that one thing that we all need as uh, creators, which is to like what you're doing and like the audience you're working for. And as a result, I became pretty successful at what I was doing. But you, you mentioned Tammy there, and uh, we can re remember one or two of the other. I mean, there was obviously things like the Beano, which I think is kind of being rebooted at the moment. I used to read things like Look In. But what you started writing was very different from that, wasn't it? I mean, it was a, a lot more adult orientated, should we say, or older teenage orientated. Um, it was and it wasn't. I, I think uh, the, the, the trend in British comics uh, had in the past, if you like, to be uh, a little patronizing, a little middle, middle class. Uh, but the most successful comic strips have always had what, for one of another term, could be called a working class flavor, uh, raw, hard hitting, subversive. Now, uh, so that's basically what I was writing. And I think uh, initially, at least, probably not that far outside the original age range. But it had a, a much more lasting appeal, if you like, because... Um, we weren't talking down to the readers. And uh, I, I think we're all familiar with the, um, the truism that, uh, you know, a, story, a good story can be read by any people from any age group. And uh, so that's what happened. The, the stories had a kind of edginess, a hard-hitting quality, which was not necessarily uh, making them too adult for children. Um, but, um, yeah, I mean, the, the, their appeal, for example, when I started 2000 AD, uh, believe it or not, there were readers as young as five or six, as well as uh, readers 16 and upwards. And, uh, and I, gu I guess that's the thing to aim for, uh, uh, you know, a comic with a, or, or a book with a, with a very large uh, age appeal. Yeah, um, we should say it wasn't without controversy, though, those early um, attempts to shift the market a little bit. And I think at least one of your titles got closed down fairly or well, within a couple of years of starting. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the, the thing was that the stories up until uh, the mid-70s on the boys' comic side uh, were old-fashioned. They were antique. Uh, they didn't feature uh, anyone ever getting killed. Um, so along I come along with uh, you know, a war comic uh, and then a, a kind of a street comic called Action. And inevitably, it's how far do you go? Now, the, the, what happened in that instance, uh, th things, if you like, went out of hand. Um, but it's almost inevitable when you have a comic revolution that there will be casualties. And um, with 2000 AD, I think we got it right because uh, we could escape into science fiction. And we could say, well, these aren't real people. They're actually robots or cyborgs or whatever. Um, but um, I, I wouldn't call the, the action we had gratuitous, but it was certainly shocking by comparison with what had gone before. Yeah, and, and I guess you, I mean, I think the, the graphic novel probably has a longer history than this, but really what you were doing is paved the way for the modern um, resurgence of graphic novels and where we are today. And I guess is that, is that where you are today as well? More, you're more comfortable with what we would describe and see as the graphic novel than the comic book? Um. Well, I, I think comic books have sort of evolved into uh, graphic novels. And here's the thing, just to give you an idea. Uh, if you consider, the, for example, uh, the, the circulation of 2000 AD when it began was um, uh, just over 200,000 copies a week. Uh, today, uh, a graphic novel is going to sell between... Uh, 1,000 to maybe 5,000 copies uh, per volume. Now, it have a much, much higher cover price, but 
Um, the reality is that uh, these books are not reaching as wide an audience as they should. Um, there are various uh, excuses for why that is. Uh, there's the premise that uh, comics have uh, increasingly appealed to an older age group and that kids today are interested in uh, computer games and, uh, uh, and other things other than comics. Uh, that's because we failed them. Uh, it, it's simply not true uh, that kids are no longer interested in comics. We just haven't supplied them with the right comics. And the, the proof of that, if you like, you can see in France where uh, they have uh, what they call bon dessine, uh beautiful comic books that appeal uh, across the ages. Um, so, you know, the, the, the British industry is, is in a strange place, I think. Um, but the audience is as strong as ever. Uh, as you may know, there are comic conventions in almost every town now. Uh, and so there's a tremendous um, uh, desire for this material. Uh, but for the most part, uh, that the British industry isn't delivering for one very simple reason. Um, the books are not creator owned. So in France, where they are creator owned, you're, you're going to get writers and artists who will spend years sometimes uh, creating a book. But in Britain, it tends to be uh, just as when I first entered the industry, it tends to be about speed. In other words, how quickly can you produce a story? Uh, the, for instance, um, uh, um, one uh, very famous writer, uh, when I first met, met him in the 1970s, he said, my name's so-and-so, uh, and I earn more money than the British Prime Minister, which was quite bizarre. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm sure that wouldn't be the case today. Uh, but he was writing so many stories in a day. And he said to me, how many stories can you write in a day? And I said, well, I'm not even sure I can write one in a day. He said, well, that's no good. You've, you've got to, you know, that, that principle of, of not caring. Um, it, it's a miracle that a number of us still produce quality work, uh, which is still remembered and, and is still ongoing today, such as 2008. Uh, you mentioned France. How does Japan's market then compare with that? Because my impression of Japan is it's got a very healthy comic book uh, history and culture, but they are all quite corporate owned, aren't they? I mean, manga is a company that is vast. Yeah, yeah. Um, Japan, uh, on, on the manga side, uh, girls' comics uh, experienced a brief renaissance uh, with manga. Um, I get the feeling that that's been and gone in Britain because we are a very insular nation and we, we do like... Uh, particular kinds of stories. Um, in, uh, in Europe, manga is still very, very strong. Um, and of course, what they, they often produce are these uh, huge books. And that must be because of the, uh, the sales returns on it and, and the way manga is set up. I mean, it, it, it basically, um, Japan is number one uh, in the world. France is number two. Uh, France is the second biggest uh, uh, producer of uh, comics. Um, it has, I mean, I, I work for France uh, and, and it has its challenges, but they do produce beautiful books. America is number three and the majority of American comic books are uh, superhero and would be Marvel, DC or, or Dark Horse. Yeah. Let, let me take you back a little bit to how you work, because I, I think people will be interested to hear about this. If we start, I mean, I know uh, you worked with a partner on, on AD2000 and Judge Dredd, for instance, as a character. But my understanding is that you actually did a lot of the early development work of Judge Dredd. And the the guy we know today is, is, is the guy that you created in those early stories. How, I mean, for a start, w what, what's, how do you approach the beginning of that? How do you decide... Um, what you're going to be doing in the comic book and how does that differ from perhaps a lot of our audience who write novels um, will write a single novel, possibly a series? Okay, well, I'll, I'll, I'll briefly take you through uh, Judge Dredd. Um, what happened there was uh, a writing colleague of mine uh, said uh, that he wanted to do uh, a cop story about a really extreme cop that would be a kind of satire, if you like, 
And um, so he, he uh, came up with this basic idea. Um, he then wrote some scripts, which didn't really work for me. Um, we worked on a combined version, uh, which went to uh, the artist Carlos Esquera. Carlos came back with a very futuristic cop, much more futuristic than either of us had uh, envisaged. And um, uh, so John uh, said, oh, no, I don't like that guy. He, he looks like a Spanish pirate. Um, but I felt that the guy looked right. So this, this often happens in, well, it certainly happens in comics all the time, where people make, uh, if you like, errors of judgment in the heat of the moment. You know, in other words, they're, they're, they visualize something in their minds. And, and this possibly happens more with comics than with, well, it must happen by comparison with a text novel, because you, you have an image of how you want your secret agent to look, how you want your uh, super cop to look. Um, and so then I wrote um, what I felt would be the right story uh, for uh, Judge Dredd. And then I wasn't happy with that. Uh, I mean, we all of us as writers go through this process of first, second, third, and fourth draft. Meanwhile, uh, my colleague John had said he didn't want anything more to do with the character because he didn't like the way it looked. And so I had this, uh, and the artist had gone as well. Uh, and the artist had said, because of uh, right situation, that he didn't want to, to draw Judge Dredd. So what I had was, I had a great character, and no writer, and no artist, because the original creative team had left. And I went through various versions, and um, I put it out to a number of uh, creators, um, and uh, I wasn't happy with their results. And then one version came back, where it had elements in it uh, that I'd missed and John had missed and we'd all missed. And I thought, that's what we need. It makes the character more heroic. Um, and so I used an element from this guy's story uh, plus my own story. And, and that's how Judge Dredd emerged. So it's a very um, complex process, which probably couldn't happen today because we are much more aware uh, of, uh, you know, the importance of, of our role as creators. But back then, there weren't even any bylines on the story. So when Judge Dredd appeared, no one had any idea who wrote it. And, and that was the norm. It's part of the rather prehistoric um, uh, background of, of British comics. And although things are much better today, we still bear a certain legacy um, from that era. Um, so that was how Judge Dredd uh, came into being. I knew he would be very, very successful uh, with the uh, readers because we, had, we got a lot of feedback from them in their letters. And we had what was called a, like a popularity poll, uh, probably not that different to the, uh, you, you know, the kind of graphs you get on, on uh, on ebook sales, and so you can actually see which stories the readers liked and which episodes. So, as long as you paid attention to reader feedback, uh, you could end up with saying, "Okay, this is what they're looking for," and inevitably, what they, what the readers were looking for was an extreme character. And when you when you write um, the stories, how do you do little sketches, sort of stick men sketches, uh, and that's how you write? So you imagine each frame, or do you just write in text and just wait to see how the guy's going to compose the frames and so on? Uh, neither of those, actually. Um, I I'd say it's remarkably similar to um, uh, a screenplay, uh, except that in um, a film screenplay, invariably the descriptions of the characters uh, are not that uh, comprehensive. Uh, for a comic strip, uh, the descriptions can be quite massive. Um, I, I think if anyone was really curious about this, uh, an extreme example would be my colleague Alan Moore's uh, scripts, uh, which are like, uh, like novel length, uh, you know, each picture. He, he might describe exactly where the armchair is in the room, uh, the color of the room, and so forth. Um, but uh, for me, I, I tend to approach it like a, like a screenplay. Um, 
and uh, because it has to have a, a flow, a, a sequential speed about it, which is has so many similarities to a movie, and in some respects differs from from a novel, uh, where uh, unless you've got a real page turner, um, you know you don't perhaps get that that sense of movement quite so strongly. Um, let's let's move a bit more up to date then. So let me ask you a question because the area you're in is is an area that people can feel very passionate about and, and vocational rather than commercially orientated and, and typically will just start and want to want to be a part of the comic book industry. Is it possible in 2017 for somebody starting out to get involved in comic books and make a successful commercial career out of it? Um. The short answer would probably be no, uh, not in Britain. If they wanted to work for Marvel or DC, uh, they could probably do well financially. Um, if they were an artist as well as a writer, uh, that would increase their chances. Um, but by and large, it's very, very difficult uh, to, to get anywhere in comics today. Um, the one exception perhaps might be France, uh, but one would have to have some connections with the industry there. But I, I think the proof of what I'm saying is that I think in the last, uh, in the last 15 years, I cannot think uh, of a, uh, a leading writer who has come out from, you know, from nowhere and entered the industry and, and done very well. Uh, artists, yes, uh, that, that's, that's different again, but um, for a writer or a writer-artist, very, very difficult. I think you'd have to go back probably to the 1990s, um, and of course the, the, the famous examples would be Neil Gaiman, um, Alan Moore, uh, Grant Morrison, and they, in, in each case you would be going back to the 1980s. Yeah, and okay. Well, I, 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 I wish I could yeah. <laughs> be more positive about it. Uh, it. It sounds so negative, and it's an industry that I, I'm full of enthusiasm for. Um, and there are some things that can happen, but they happen so randomly that it would be foolish to mislead people. Uh, for example, a number of comic books get made into movies, and arguably they are more likely to get made into a film, or at least be film optioned, uh, than a text novel. Because um, Hollywood producers have a short attention span, they look at a comic book and they say, ah, I get it. And so, yeah, a, a number of um, comic books do get optioned as movies, and that's one way where you can make a living. Um, but there's a lot of disappointments uh, uh, in, in that area. Um, I have finally had uh, 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 a movie uh, gone forward and it's now in um, um, uh, after, you know, it's, it's been put together. So it's called Accident Man. So uh, fingers crossed that's finally going to happen. Um, but they do take a lot of work. Your picture's just frozen for the second. Let me just, uh, you can still hear me okay, yeah. Pat? Yeah, yeah, I yeah. can. Let me yeah. just see if I can unfreeze this because it's... Uh... Why is it doing that? Am I just... Did you want me to reprise? Uh, no, the, the audio is absolutely fine, and that's our number one thing. The video is a kind of later thing. Where, oh, you're back again. You're moving. So let me just don't make that. But there we okay. go. I can pick this up exactly as it was. Um, you must have had a few false starts on the movies because movie companies, I mean, you can't go into a cinema now without tripping over uh, another uh, comic book character who's been put onto the big screen. But there's always been a bit of a thirst for that in cinema. And I guess you've had a lot of dealings with the movie industry over the years and um, probably a few dead ends. Absolutely. Um, I've had any number of uh, characters optioned um, for, for film. And of course, what you realize then is that if it's optioned, it does not. An accident man, I think, uh, was optioned about uh, three times. And this only on this fourth time that it's gone through the production process. And they're now at the editing stage. It's a uh, uh, film starring uh, Scott Adkin, uh, martial arts uh, actor. And um, 
Yeah, it, it, it's tricky. And I think uh, for anyone who, who's going down that road, uh, I, I think the thing to always avoid, which, which applies, must surely apply to all of us, but Hollywood producers will try it on, uh, to, they'll ask for a shopping agreement. In other words, they want your uh, intellectual property for free and they want the right to um, shop it around um, uh, the studios, uh, which of course, you know, as in anything in life, if you get it for free, it's not valued. So yeah, you have to charge uh, a good going rate. Uh, and um, yeah, there's, there's, a, <laughs> there's an awful lot of sharks in Hollywood. And, but after a while, you, you, you get quite good at uh, spotting them, seeing what they're like, and you kind of enjoy the conflict, or at least I have anyway. Yeah, well, that chimes very nicely with the advice that Cal Moriarty, who's quite experienced in this area, gave <clears throat> uh, as well recently. Um, now, you mentioned Neil Gaiman earlier. Mark sat next to Neil on... <clears throat> Excuse me. Mark sat next to Neil on BBC Front Row, a programme you've been on recently, um, and Neil gave a quote which I think will live long in our industry, which is if he was starting out today, he would be independently publishing himself. He would turn down traditional deals because he's completely sold on the indie publishing world. And I think this is an area that you're coming to quite enthusiastically now as well. Absolutely. And I'm really encouraged that Neil said that. Uh, I mean, considering he's such an established author in uh you know the the conventional publishing that that's really good to hear um yeah the the the, the reason for it is that um, the attraction for comics for me for a long while was that they were dynamic in other words i could sit down i could um create a story find an artist and it could be out there in print in a matter of three or four months uh today it can take uh, and has taken, it's I'm embarrassed to reveal this really, it can take three or four years sometimes. In other words, the artist uh, says, yes, I want to draw this, and then he sits on it for a year or two years and so on. And um, uh, in that sense, it can take longer than a movie. Um, so I think this is one of the reasons I, I've become quite frustrated with the industry. And I, I like the idea of being able to turn things round. So to give you an example of this, um, uh, the first uh, uh, text novel I've written recently, um, uh, Serial Killer, what, what happened was uh, I had the idea for um, uh, turning it into a novel for maybe uh, maybe a year or so, but it was only in uh, June or July that um, uh, last year that I decided uh, to write it and to get it out uh, uh, published uh, in time for 2080's uh, 40th birthday event. And uh, we made the deadline okay. So that was like from June or July last year up until um, end of January uh, this year. And um, now if I'd gone to a conventional publisher, um, even if they had uh, looked at the material positively, and there'd be no guarantee that they would because... Um, more and more publishers are uh, all these wonderful convention, you know, uh, traditional names. They're all owned by maybe one uh, transnational now. And therefore, they have a certain style and tone to them. But even if they had given me the green light, I, I suspect they would have said, OK, um, we'll put it in for next year or perhaps even the year after. I mean, I'm quoted on some of the, some of my other projects uh, uh, publishers are saying, oh, yeah, we might be able to fit you in in 2018. And uh, that just seems such a slow, long-winded way of doing things. Plus, the other experience with uh, conventional publishing, uh, which I've had and I'm sure uh, other authors have as well, a publisher will take you on and you think, well, that's fantastic, great. And then you realize that you are basically ballast at the bottom of their line and that, they're, that the majority of their line is one or two, maybe three or four uh, top selling authors at the top and and you're just there and they're not really going to market you uh, whereas um, how we've done it and it and it seems to have worked so far is we're responsible for our own marketing um, you know we're responsible for our own quality control um, you know we, we put it put the book out to four matters and so on so if so if things go wrong we've only got ourselves to blame 
Because that's the thing that traditionally authors do, often do, is spend all their time complaining about publishers, with good reason. And uh, I like the idea of we're responsible for the whole package. It, it can be tough. Uh, and obviously, I couldn't have, it'd have been impossible to have done without my wife. In other words, she takes care of the, uh, the, the business side, and I, and I have the easy part, which is just, just sitting down and writing, writing fiction. Um, but I think, uh, I think it is the way to go, and I, I'm in awe of all you guys. Uh, I mean, it's your examples uh, that we followed. In other words, we, we listened to your podcasts, and, and we looked, looked things up online, and we thought, hey, this is the way to go. It, it's got energy behind it, and um, that surely must be what it's all about. Yeah, there's a definitely, uh, definitely an energy and an esprit de corps, and it's a fun movement to be a part of at the moment in the Indian. It's great to hear you talking about it so enthusiastically. I think you're going to be... You are all happy, <laughs> that, 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 and that is remarkable. Uh, I, I've tried to sort of uh, shield that part, but uh, British comics aren't really that happy a place uh, for the most part, and, and it is noticeable how what a great sense of community you guys have uh and, and so one is uh, automatically uh uh drawn to that um yeah no it's it makes it very attractive so your text novels um pat is there a crossover with the style of comic book writing um not, there probably will be um the first one uh, it's a black comedy actually about the world of comics. Uh, it started off as a sitcom with the BBC uh, years ago. And uh, the uh, producer at the BBC greenlit it, and then his boss turned it down. Um, but we always felt that uh, the, the, the world of comics was uh, a colourful and uh, humorous place. And I, so I decided uh, to novelise this, uh, this sitcom. And uh, so it's basically a black comedy. Um, but I think it, uh, I'm, I'm still, although it's uh, part of a, um, a series, it's uh, book one of four, uh, once again, following a lot of the ground rules that we, we picked up from you guys, that series are, are a good idea. Uh, but looking beyond it, uh, I would definitely do uh, an adventure science fiction series, probably thereafter. And of course, um, the the influence of uh, of comics is bound to come into it. Uh, I, I'm sure the story would be fast moving, um, but there's there's all kinds of things that I can do in um, a text novel that is quite rough to to do in a in a comic strip because um, it, the artist can only produce three pages a week, maybe four or five pages if he's fast. Um, and so th there's a wealth of detail that you can get into a text novel that you can't into a comic strip. Uh, otherwise, the artist would be drawing forever. Um, so th th those, are, uh, those are all possibilities to explore. And, and the one that I must mention above all others, because uh, there may well be um, uh, some of your listeners that are, uh, are thinking in this direction, and I would encourage them. Um, uh, although it would appear that boys' comics are the most well-known and the most successful, in fact, surprise, surprise, girls' comics outsold boys' comics by two to one. They disappeared because of apathy within the industry for the reasons I've already given. Um, but they were outselling boys' comics by two to one. Now, that won't come as a surprise to you and to many of your listeners because... Um, Women have always read uh, more than uh, the men. And uh, a lot of those themes uh, that were in girls' comics uh, can be adapted into text novels for the YA audience and perhaps older. And uh, the, the examples I would give would be The Hunger Games, for example. That's a typical girls' comic uh, in terms of its... It's quite harsh, uh, it's got fantastic elements, um, but it's not about big guns, it's about emotions, it's about feelings and so on. And I would say that um, there is a, not just a gap in the market, I would say there's a chasm in the market uh, where female uh, mystery and adventure fiction 
perhaps aimed at that YA audience. I know there are some books that uh, fill that category, but where girls' comics were concerned, we, we were covering endless numbers of them with uh, a comic I started called Misty, uh, which was kind of like scaled down Stephen King, that kind of material. And um, so that's an area that I think I would probably um, return to myself, but rather than as a comic strip, uh, to say, okay, um, you know, let, let's let's try and do something for the for the YA audience, um, but perhaps um, uh, harder uh, and perhaps with a more raw energy than some of those uh, YA books, which can be. Uh, I, I, I forgive me, I can't think of another word really, but a little middle class, a little too smooth. Um, the kind of thing I'm thinking of is more Grange Hill. You know that that kind of raw raw tone to it. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm, I remember sort of the breakout really from that era, and the, you know the '60s and '70s. There was a counterculture in the '60s, but it took a long time to really come through to things like comic books and TV series. That was the '70s where um, we started to see sort of more gritty stuff, and it, you know, it woke me up as a child born in 1967 who got taken to the cinema to see one of our dinosaurs is missing all this tawdry boring boring stuff and then suddenly mid 70s it started to get more interesting and more exciting um for us all but that's a perfect analysis of uh, of where comics were and and that energy that i think we can uh, claim for new generations yeah yeah well pat's been fascinating talking to you i'm really excited to hear about your your next stage i feel a little bit sad about the industry and um you know funny i was trying to think of the comic but you, you mentioned the sitcom actually there was a sitcom called space you might remember it in the 1990s on british television with simon Pegg, and he was a struggling comic book artist and in that series the comic book industry was just was portrayed as bitter desperate and dark uh, so <laughs> pretty much everything you said back well, it's funny, I, I have i have to i have to interrupt you there and say well the producer of space gareth edwards was the producer who took an interest in uh, in serial killer and uh, uh and liked it obviously because he has an affection for comics and uh so that, that's that's where we um, that's where we uh, came from. Dark yeah. Star Comics with uh, yes, I remember it well. But it was obviously a satire of it, and I think probably comes from the same sort of place that you come from as well. Um, yeah, I'm, well, Simon Pegg, like so many uh, uh, people, uh, he grew up reading 2000 AD, and uh, you know, there, there, there's so many people in the uh, media today, uh, Edgar Wright, Jonathan Ross, and so forth who grew up reading these comics, and uh, they still have an affection for them today. So uh, um, I think if it is possible to uh, capture some of that flavor uh, in text novels, um, I, I, I think it can be well received. Uh, I mean, if, if you think, for example, of Grange Hill, uh, the, the opening credits have a comic book theme and so I think if it's possible to just have a comic book echo in either the cover or the title or whatever, you could, you know, your, 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 um, some of your listeners could actually be drawing on that energy. Um, because it is very, I think you summed it up so well by saying it was gritty. And, and it's that grittiness um, that... Uh, perhaps isn't even properly catered for today yeah and i think hunger games is a good example of where that is beginning to happen and how huge was the hunger games and then a lot of the stuff around it is actually gone back a little bit to being quite moderated and a little bit softer it was hunger games actually does have quite an edge to it i mean children are being killed in that uh in a it goes back to lord of the flies type thing and lord of the flies is something that again stands out as an outlier but why was that an outlier because that actually was an amazing book and yet decades go through and yeah. you don't really get the same. You get the kind of Enid Blight and let's be polite to the children. In, uh, I, I went to the cinema uh, and uh, I observed the audience uh, of Hunger Games and they were predominantly uh, young women, uh, maybe somewhere between, say, 18 to 25, something like that, often on their own or with a friend. Uh, and it was quite remarkable to see that. And... The thing I would say as well um, is that there are very precise rules to writing uh, girls' mystery, action, or, or science fiction um, stories. 
And uh, an example that I, I shall never forget uh, is the film Never Let Me Go, which appears to be a girl's comic type uh, mystery, but isn't. Um, basically, it's a, 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 like a Harry Potter style boarding school uh, where um, children are, are kept as clones. Now, that, that it's a nightmarish concept. Obviously, they're, they're, they're being used for um, organ transplants. Um, now, if it was a traditional girls comic, uh, halfway through the drama, uh, the, the heroines, the hero, uh, would rebel, would run, would, would fight back against evil authority. But because this is actually more of an art house film, um, that doesn't happen. It's uh, based on a Japanese novel. And uh, to, I, I watched the film and, and I didn't really know what it was about. And I had some great actors in it. And then I started to get very depressed when I saw that they weren't going to fight back, which is so fundamental uh, that the hero and heroine uh, have to be uh, proactive. Um, and to my astonishment, I saw several um, young women in the audience walk out of the film. It's the only time I've ever seen that happen. In other words, they got the same feeling. They thought, I don't like this, and they just walked out. Um, so that's the thing with this kind of um, uh, mystery adventure action uh, kind of story for girls, just as for boys, the hero must be proactive, must be. And if they're not, the story will go down like a lead balloon, and rightly so, in yeah. my opinion. Well, I, I I read the novel Never Let Me Go. I haven't, haven't actually seen the film, but interested to see the film. But I, it's a very bleak, dark, very dystopian view of humanity. Uh, and but it's it's done in a very strange way because, <clears throat> as you say, the characters are quite at ease with their roles, and they never really resist it. There's a a sort of nudge here and there about their fate but they don't really ever question it and that's the disturbing thing about it but I think that's probably doesn't really lend itself to the type of ad adventure that you th as you say a YA audience is really looking for at the moment we should say we've got loads of uh, independent artists on our books uh, I'm say on our books makes it sound like a publisher in our community I should say uh, who are turning out fantastic uh, novels that do really fit in this genre and that's the exciting thing about the indie industry it's a space where if you want it you will probably find it somewhere and uh, I think you're going to be a big part of that Pat that's that's wonderful to hear that's really good to know and uh, yeah I'm looking forward to adding to it I don't, if you were watching on video, uh, you probably winced, or if you weren't watching video when I said that Pat looked like a beach boy, but he, he's got this kind of Californian look, but he's actually living, he, is, he likes the sun, they're living down in uh, Spain, Spain, I think now. Mm. Um, absolutely riveting, fascinating guy, really interesting to hear him. I mean, obviously a little bit wound up about how difficult it is to make money with comics now, pretty cynical about that. Uh, interestingly, I had an exchange on email with somebody who's uh, trying to get into comics now, and they emailed us and said, would our course be suitable for comics? I want to make money from that. And I sort of emailed it back and said, well, there's an interview coming up. You want to listen to that? Um, because Pat's been around the block a few times. Um, but actually, funny enough, it's one of those things, if you talk creativity, Pat was a little bit, um, not bitter, but you know, just cynical and uh, you know, there was enthusiasm for, for the arts that's frustrated by the commercial side of things, but that's the same energies that's fed into the pictures you see and the stories you see in the comic books. Yeah, absolutely. And also that kind of experience is one that I'm familiar with. And, you know, I've, I've, been, I've been traditionally published. I was frustrated with the machine um, of trying to get more, you know, get different books out there and, and what uh, self-publishing has enabled people like Pat and people like me and all of our listeners to do is, is to is to bypass um, people, the gatekeepers who have previously been able to, to put the kibosh on a, on a piece of creative work. We can now go directly to our audience, which is, is an extremely um, exciting development. It's also something that is possible now with comics. Amazon is opening up new avenues to get comics onto the Kindle. Um, um, Apple is very big on that. There's some apps um, for the uh, for iDevices that enable comics to be read in a really kind of native um, and fluid format which works really well too so um 
gradually all of these kinds of impediments are being rolled away and, and, and it's enabling creative people to get their stuff as widely distributed as possible. Yeah, yeah, great. Uh, really interesting talking to Pat and uh, uh, we'll wish him all the best of luck with his, uh, his novel uh, writing. I also, before we move on, I also need to thank Lisa because um, it was my brother's 40th birthday um, last, on Saturday, or two, as this goes out, it'll be about two Saturdays ago. And um, Lisa hooked me up with an artist who worked on um, 2000 AD and we, I commissioned a piece of art from him. He did a, a 2000 AD cover with my brother on it with Judge Dredd. So maybe I'll, uh, we'll, we'll put that um, on, on screen for people who want to see what that looks like. But it was absolutely brilliant. Um, oh, and amazing. I basically won the birthday with, with that. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, thanks very much to Lisa uh, for setting that up. Much appreciated. Yeah, you've won every birthday coming. You are very competitive with your brother, so I am. Yeah. you're going to get something amazing <laughs> when, you're, when you're 40. Yeah, I wish. Um, <laughs> okay, let's uh, talk about this competition. So Pat and Lisa very kindly offered uh, three copies, signed copies, of Pat's uh, first novel, Serial Killer. I think it's co-written. I think they said that in interview. Yes, it is. For memory, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, so if you pop along to selfpublishingformula.com forward slash Pat Mills, P-A-T-M-I-L-L-S, and uh, enter your email there, and we will select somebody in three weeks' time uh, or so to win one of those copies uh, of the book. And thank you to Pat and to Lisa for that. Really, I really enjoyed that interview and uh, I think it's good for the podcast to stretch its legs a little bit and go outside um, sometimes the very sort of book orientated world that we live in. So who knows how many people are out there um, who want to write or want to illustrate or perhaps as Pat alluded to, the best of both worlds is to do both. Yeah, absolutely. And and Pat is, he is kind of comic royalty, at least in this country. So it it was great to get him on. Yeah, great. That's it. We'll speak to you again next week. You've been listening to the Self-Publishing Formula podcast. Visit us at selfpublishingformula.com for more information, show notes, and links on today's topics. You can also sign up for our free video series on using Facebook ads to grow your mailing list. If you've enjoyed the show, please consider leaving us a review on iTunes. We'll see you next time.